one of the things that pertains directly to topics I talk about a lot, which is climate change, the dynamically ever-changing climate of this planet, is that we pulled out of the Paris Climate Accords. And a lot of people are upset about that, but uh, I would like to reassure you, there is no reason to be upset. In fact, that was definitely the move to make. Why do I say that? Does that mean I'm a climate change denier because I'm in favor of pulling out of the uh, the climate accords? No, not at all. What it means is, is that, in fact, just the opposite. I uh, totally affirm that the planet, the climate of this planet changes. It changes all the time. It changes regularly. And quite frequently, it changes a lot faster and more severely than we have witnessed in our lifetimes. And this is something, uh, an important uh, insight into the way our planet works that is being overlooked. And we are spending a lot of money or have spent a lot of money or we're going to be spending a lot of money to meet the uh, the restrictions uh, and goals of the uh, of the Paris Climate Agreement. But primarily what it meant was, and and what the agenda was all about was a gigantic wealth transfer from the developed nations to the undeveloped nations, all done in the name of climate justice. In effect, what it is is, is to me, a giant shakedown effort. Uh, and of course, the potential recipient nations of the largesse being transferred from primarily America and American taxpayers, of course, they're all on a board with it. And they will, of course, endorse the climate crisis narrative if it means that they're going to be on the receiving end of tens to hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of dollars. So what do I say? What do I mean when I talk about the Earth's climate dynamically changing constantly all the time? Well, sometimes those changes are actually even catastrophic, which brings us to a whole other question about uh, a reinterpretation of our past on this planet, uh, because all the models of prehistory that are now dominating the narratives of academia were models that were uh, that that came to uh, that were developed were, were developed during a period of where there was a certain interpretation of Earth history, what we would call gradualism, incrementalism uniformitarianism, the idea that things change so slowly and almost imperceptibly. And in that framework, when humans come along, whatever we do that affects the climate or the environment in any way whatsoever can now be seen to perturb this passive state of, of climatic and environmental change that has prevailed on the earth for thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. I challenge that narrative because having now spent over three decades, going on four decades, in the study of past environmental change on this planet, I've become convinced overwhelmingly, and I'm not the only one, that yes, the history of this planet and specifically within the time that we humans have been here has been profoundly dynamic and that we need to come to terms with that. One of the ways that the environment has changed in ways that we didn't even anticipate a generation or two ago is in the form of great tsunamis. Now, you know what a tsunami is. We used to call them tidal waves, but they're not, of course, being driven by the tides. Uh, we use the Japanese term tsunami now. What is a tsunami? Well, it's a giant sea wave that makes landfall. And we've seen a couple of them uh, in in uh, the last, uh, since twenty. Uh, 2020, uh, 2020, what year are we in? In 2004, the Indonesian one and then the Japanese one. Um, so we've had two good, big examples where we've seen tsunami waves come and we can see the destruction that they make uh, once they make landfall. We've seen the, the action of a tsunami and how it makes landfall. There are two terms to learn. If you want to talk intelligibly about tsunamis, two terms, uh, that you want to learn here, the run-up height and the run-in height. The run-up height is basically telling you how high, what elevation did that tsunami wave reach um, before it uh, made it about face and went back out to the to the ocean basin. That's the run-up height. The run-in height is how 
or the run in distance, excuse me, is how far inland does it go before it finally stops and then the, the current flow reverses and it flows back to the ocean basin. So you've got the run up height and you've got the run in height. Now, a little bit of, of logical thinking here should make it clear that if you've got a steep coastline and you've got, let's say you've got a tsunami that's coming in at 40 feet, which is about roughly what the, the Indonesian tsunami was, 40, 50 feet when it made landfall. So it's coming in, you've got a steep gradient and it's coming in, the steeper that gradient, the 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 less is going to be the run in distance. Now the run the run up may not be different whether it's the gradient is this steep or this steep. But you can see that if it goes from this steep to this steep, the run in distance is going to be much further. Now this this is an important point to understand when we get to, into talking about the end of the last ice age and the catastrophic rise of sea level uh, during this period when the glaciers were melting. And a tsunami making landfall uh, with a 400 or 450 foot lower sea level is going to have a different effect on, a, on the coastlines of the world back then. And the main reason for that is because of the fact that as sea levels fell, it exposed the very shallow gradient coastal shelves that rim all of the continents of the earth, see? Whereas now those continental shelves are mostly underwater. Okay, but if you drop sea levels 400, 450 feet, guess what happens? You start exposing those shallow rims. That has an effect that needs to be taken into account when we start considering questions of antiquity and questions of prehistory. Now, we're going to get into a, some a, a very interesting discussion here with some of the specifics of uh, tsunamis and the effects that they have on coastlines. Uh, but we're also going to be talking about sea levels. We're going to look at some of the recent evidence showing that sea levels have risen and fallen even in recent times and how much they have. Most people don't realize, you know, we talk about, uh, oh, sea levels have risen. Uh, if they rise another foot and a half, we're going to have all of the, you know, New York City is going to be underwater. The Maldives are going to be underwater. You know, it's going to create a great catastrophe. Well, Look at it this way. The sea levels have risen in the last century about eight inches, which is about the same as they rose the century before that. And at the current rates of sea level rise, it may be a couple of inches more than that. But I think projecting current rates of sea level rise, we're not getting into some of the earlier scare stories that we were being bombarded with back 20 and 30 years ago that, oh, my God, sea level is going to rise four, four or five or six feet by the end of the, the century and so on. We've seen no indication that anything is going to uh, uh, attain that rate of, of sea level rise. For one thing, because we don't have catastrophically melting six to seven million cubic miles of catastrophically melting glacial ice. We don't have that now. Um, in fact, it's even questionable how much actually has been lost from the, the two great reservoirs of glacial ice on the planet, Greenland and Antarctica. So we're going to get into talking about sea level rise. We're going to talk some more about tsunamis. We're not, I mean, these are very, very interesting and important topics that we're only going to be able to sort of uh, just get a, a sense of. I mean, there's a whole lot more to, to this subject than we're going to be able to talk about uh, in the limited time we've got here. But we're going to, we're going to kind of introduce some of these ideas. And then uh, in a follow-up episode, we'll be able to dive, may take a much deeper dive into that. Um, and consider the 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 the, uh, the consequences for uh, what would happen again today if if we had well let's say I'm going to show you evidence of a ancient tsunami that may have been at least 600 feet in its run up height uh, in the recent past. So with that note, I'm going to be joined by my colleague John Arthur Fialo. Oh, there he is. Howdy, howdy. Waiting quietly and patiently in the wings. Um, hello, John. Howdy, Randall. Good to join you again. I'm glad that we're here. I know. And I think Florida has been uh, catastrophically submerged about three times in the predictions by now. I think that's probably about right. Uh, um, give or take. Uh, and, and we've also, you know, disappeared into a pink mist was one of, I think in the 1970s, was one of the more bizarre claims of climate change. 
I don't remember the pink mist. Some strange, some strange claims have been made about climate change, which is real, but yeah. it's it's governed by very, very large factors. Well, so, I remember well in the seventies that the fear was global cooling, and possibly even in its more extreme form, uh, perhaps even the beginning stages of a new ice age. Interestingly, in my opinion, I'll say this, in my opinion, I think that the fears of global cooling had a more realistic basis than the fears of global warming. And I'll tell you why, for two reasons. And this, this is important, I think, to put this into, into context. Number one, in the 70s, by the time we get to the early to the mid 70s, we had 20 years, a couple of decades of radiocarbon dating to allow us to see that, uh, number one, the ice ages were a lot more contracted than we had imagined them to be. And their changes, both growing and melting away, were a lot closer to our own time than we had previously imagined. So that was one thing, right? And then we began to be able to date. Um, we found, for example, the assumption, glaciers were covering North America for 100,000 years, pretty much a big stable mass of ice. And then somewhere... 30, 40, 40, 50,000 years ago, climate began to warm because of changing geometries between the earth and the sun. So the climate began to gently warm. And as it warmed, the ice began to shrink. And after tens of thousands of years, it melted back to what it is now. So far, so good. This, this is a, a model that prevailed for a century or so or more. Now comes radiocarbon dating, and we go up to Canada, and we discover that under the most recent layer of glacial till is organic stuff, you know, the remnants of forests, pollen, remnants of plants and leaves and branches and stuff that apparently were overrun by the glaciers. And then they got buried under a bunch of glacial till when the glaciers melted away. But though radiocarbon dating showed that roughly 30 to 40,000 years ago, there were forests growing in the region of Hudson Bay. Now, why is that significant? Well, because Hudson Bay would have been the core, the center of mass, of, of the glacial mass. It was where the ice was the thickest, maybe up to a mile and a half thick, right? So obviously, if there were forests growing there 30,000, 35, 40,000 years ago, you didn't have one long, continuous, unbroken mass of ice for 100 or 200,000 years. Well, that then compelled a rethinking of the timetables, right? It, unless radiocarbon dating was completely wrong. Okay. Well, the other thing was, okay, so then at the same time, we're beginning to reconstruct these models of deep history, if you want to call it that. Uh, we go back into the past, you know. 50, 100,000, 200,000 years. And we're, we, okay, we've established there was this great ice age. And during the great ice age, the, the world was very, very different than it is now uh, in many, many different ways, which is worthy of a whole conversation in itself. But the point is, is was there any time during the, 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 the glacial epoch when there were warm periods like now? 